I'm going to move straight on so we don't waste time, because time is tight. The next item of business is a debate on motion 11967 in the name of Aileen Campbell on success of the Commonwealth Games. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons down. I call on Aileen Campbell to speak to move the motion. Minister, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to bring this debate to the Chamber this afternoon because while across this Chamber we often have disagreements on this topic, celebrating the achievements of Team Scotland during the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, we are, I'm sure, absolutely united. Because on Tuesday the 17th of April, Team Scotland returned home following their best ever away games, bringing back with them a total of 44 medals, surpassing the previous record of 29 set at the 2006 Games in Melbourne. And I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all the athletes who represented Team Scotland, along with the coaches, the managers, the nutritionists, the physiotherapists, the doctors, the family, the friends and the volunteers who travelled to the Gold Coast to support them. I would also like to uh, put on record my thanks uh, to the Chair and Chief Executive Paul Bush and John Doig for, and all their colleagues at Team Scotland for the phenomenal effort it took to get every competitor to the start line and in peak condition. The logistical operation alone to arrange flights, accommodation and kit for some 400 Scots is hugely complex, requiring great skill and dedication. All this work behind the scenes enabled the athletes to concentrate on their performance and perform they did. The team were in, uh, ably led into the Carrara Stadium by Ailey Doyle, the first female flag bearer to do so, and a fitting tribute to her achievements as an athlete, as an ambassador, an inspiring figure for so many, and for her hugely professional conduct over so many years. Mark Austin uh, won Scotland's first medal in the triathlon, getting Team Scotland on the medal table. But the medals didn't stop coming, and nor did the happy memories or the stories of resilience and endurance. Duncan Scott won in six medals, the most ever achieved by a Scottish athlete at a single Games. John and Katie Archibald's sibling double act and medal-winning performances in the velodrome. Alex Marshall, now Scotland's most decorated Commonwealth athlete after winning medals in the pairs and uh, the fours. And it was not just, though, however, presiding officer, the medal winners who also achieved uh, greatness. The women's netball team matched their performances from Glasgow and were close to improving on that. Both beach volleyball pairs achieved great results, with the women in particular beating terms of higher ranking. However, I don't think the folk out in Australia really uh, truly appreciated the difference in climate when, when they realised that the beach, uh, the, the volleyball team in Scotland training got frozen. I think that was something far from the, the minds of those in Australia. In basketball, the men finished an amazing fourth, going unbeaten into the semi-finals. And finally, Diver James Heatley won bronze in the one metre uh, springboard, which was Scotland's first diving medal in uh, diving in 60 years. The previous winner, of course, being James's granddad. So the list goes on with phenomenal performances from the likes of Sammy Kinghorn or our, or our first female boxers, who all worked so hard and so proudly for Team Scotland. And of course, we're all pleased to know that Callum Hawkins is on the road back to fitness after we all witnessed his heroic battle uh, at the marathon. Now, I had the privilege and opportunity to join Team Scotland in recognition of the special role Scotland had as previous hosts and the learning that has been shared between our two nations to enable the Gold Coast to carry on the baton from where our games left off. The Games uh, co coincided with a report that detailed the legacy of the Glasgow 2014 Games, which included cementing Glasgow and Scotland's reputation for hosting world-class events, contributing 740 million to the Scottish economy, enabling Glasgow to host the European Championships later this year, and delivering 192 uh, community sports hubs. Gold Coast is equally embedded legacy into their games and the nations of the Commonwealth remain hugely interested in Glasgow and Scotland's efforts. Now, a key theme of the Glasgow Games was equalities and that was also something that was promoted at the Gold Coast Games. Similar to Glasgow, the Paris sports were part of the main sporting programme, a legacy from Glasgow 2014, which was the first major sporting event to have a joint programme. And Pride House in the Gold Coast was directly influenced from what was in place in Glasgow. And it is a necessity, necessary presence at the Commonwealth Games because it reminds us of the journey to go to ensure equality for LGBTI across the Commonwealth. 
However, the Gold Coast were also able to, to champion a first of their own because these games had an equal amount of medals for both men and women, which is something I know that we probably all hope for uh, for the Birmingham event <coughs> in 2022. Presiding officer, the success of Team uh, Scotland did not happen by accident. Uh, and as the motion outlines, is due to the hard work of countless athletes, governing bodies, volunteers, and the world-class system that Sports Scotland has in place to enable opportunities at grassroots right up to performance level. Uh, and the uh, timely publication yesterday from Sports Scotland of, of independent research demonstrates that the programme which they support are having a positive impact on those taking part. Both adults and children are reporting that they are more physically active since joining a sports club or participating in the active schools programme, helping create a healthier lifestyle as well as integrating <coughs> into their local community. This research, along with the recent research by, the Sco by Scottish Athletics, is vital in helping us gain a better understanding of the demographic and motivations of people who are regularly taking part in sport and physical exercise, along with highlighting those who need more assistance in achieving a more active lifestyle. It enables all of us to tell the positive and transformative impact of sport in order to ensure we endeavour to enable more people to get the chance to, be, to take part and to be active. And that's why we've protected the Sports Scotland uh, budget this year uh, and to help mitigate the impact of continued reductions in Sports Scotland's income from the National Lottery, we're providing Sports Scotland with a further 3.4 million. We'll also continue to invest in PE in schools as well as our active schools programme, providing the opportunities for generations to try different sport at an early age and create pathways so that they can continue to enjoy participating in sport throughout life and progress on, in, in, in inspired, no doubt, by the new heroes created in Australia just a few weeks ago. Now, during my time at the Gold Coast Games, I also met with the chair of UK Sport, Dame Catherine Granger. I mention uh, this because of the constructive amendment from uh, the Conservatives. Because over the next few months, we will continue to be working with UK Sport as we continue to plan for the 2018 European Championships. And to coincide with the European Championships, Scotland will be hosting the next UK Sports Cabinet. The UK Sports Cabinet provides the opportunity for sports ministers from the four home nations to discuss issues of common sporting and physical activity interest affecting the UK and provides for a collective discussion of the most strategic priorities of UK-wide importance. It's an important gathering that I hope <coughs> will see uh, more medal successes both here and in, in Glasgow and of course in Berlin. Because though Glasgow will serve as the official host uh, city of the championships in Scotland, many of the exciting events will be spread out across uh, the country, again underlining uh, Scotland's ability to host great events enabled by our first uh, class uh, facilities. And that is why we have uh, invested heavily over the last 10 years in the sport infrastructure in Scotland. Because I think it's important to note that since 2007, Sport Scotland has invested 168 million supporting councils, sporting governing bodies and other organisations to deliver a wide range of new and upgraded sports facilities to continue supporting our performance athletes alongside ensuring crit crucial access to communities and those who want to be helped towards their active uh, lifestyles. So, presiding officer, I again uh, like to offer my warmest congratulations to all of our athletes and everyone involved with Team Scotland for achieving their best away games and for ma making the entire nation extremely proud to have them as our sporting ambassadors. And I look forward to hearing from others uh, across the chamber this afternoon. Please move the motion. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I call on Brian Whittle to speak to move Amendment 11967.2. A strict six minutes, please, Mr Whittle. Uh, I know you. you're good at timekeeping. Thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Uh, I am delighted to open this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. The Commonwealth Games is a special event in the sporting calendar, and it's the second biggest multi-sport event after the Olympic Games. And as a, as a competitor and as a spectator, it holds a special place in my heart. It's generally the highest level in those participating sports that competitors can wear the Scottish vest and also gives competitors the chance to step into the arena against their elsewhere teammates from the other home nations, which, let me tell you, gives these competitions a certain edge and feel. Bragging rights live long in the memory. For example, the Scotland's 4x400 metre team's defeat of the old enemy in 1990 Commonwealth Games is still mentioned at every opportunity when in certain company, and I'm delighted to take this opportunity once again. Uh, the Commonwealth Games is special in so many ways, not just because it's the friendly games and the home nations get to compete in home colours. It also gives the opportunity for the younger, inexperienced participants to get a taste of a multi-sport event. 
And that's not to say that winning medals is necessarily any easier than any other major championships because in certain events, Commonwealth finals are akin to Olympic finals. This is important because experiencing how other sports are timetabled, how a busy athlete's village operates and how some sports are finished before others uh, and, and others are, are changing, changing that behavioural pattern. For example, the swimmers tend to be finished before the athletes' events are even started. The history of the Games goes back all the way to the 1930 and the Hamilton and Ontario where the Empire Games started. Some 165 medals were available to 11 participating countries in six, in six sports. Since then, the future of the Commonwealth Games has been brought into question many times whether it is viable or required. However, if we fast forward to 2014, where some 5,000 athletes from 71 countries descended in Glasgow, competing in 261 events in 17 sports with 824 medals on offer, there has been a recent significant ri uh, rise in the numbers with the inclusion and subsequent expansion of disability sport events, which has enhanced the spectre of the Games no end. Also, with women, as has been mentioned, given parity actually in, in the 80s at the Games, uh, it continues to give opportunity to an increasing number of athletes pulled from a third of the world's population. And this brings me to the Commonwealth Games just finished on the Gold Coast and the remarkable record and the achievements of, of our athletes. 44 medals in total, as has been mentioned. Those of us who followed the Games with the subsequent sleep deprivation cannot help but be drawn into the spectacle and the daily success of our sportsmen and women. I have to highlight the remarkable Alex Marshall again, winning his fifth Commonwealth gold medal in Lawns Bowls, and I did watch that men's force final. I also wanted to highlight Ailey Doyle's continued success on the international stage, winning a silver medal in the 400 hurdles. She's now the most decorated Scottish female track and field athlete of all time. I want to sneak in a mention for Mark Dry, winning the, his bronze medal in the Hammer, having overcome significant injuries between Glasgow and the Gold Coast. Jake Whiteman's bronze medal in the 1500, I believe, heralds the start of a very exciting career. Callum Hawkins' collapse so close to the finish of the marathon, while painful to watch, highlights his potential on a world stage. And I wanted to mention a young athlete, Zoe Clark, coached by a good friend of mine, Eddie McKenna, up in Aberdeen. She is an athlete definitely on the rise, and I've had the privilege of watching her develop and grow from the first time I met her while coaching the Scottish under-17 sprints team. And there is a reason for mentioning Zoe because I wanted to highlight the environment and support required to take an athlete to the highest level. The model that has been established in Aberdeen has reaped rewards for that area. I was there at the launch a number of years ago with Alan Wells, and the Aberdeen Sports Village is an impressive facility developed in collaboration with Aberdeen University, the Council and Sports Scotland. Eddie McKenna then helped to develop the Hydra Sun Athletics Academy, which invested in the development of talented athletes in conjunction with their coaches. It can be an expensive business for athlete and coach especially early in an athlete's international career. That early support mechanism is so important if an athlete is to reach the levels they aspire to and their own talent allows. Often while studying at college or university, and our own uh, Laura Muir made the hard decision to miss the Commonwealth Games to sit her final veteran exams at Glasgow University. The role of coaches, the clubs, the national governing bodies cannot be underestimated. And again, it's been my privilege to watch and work with some of the most dedicated coaches you will ever wish to see. But that pathway to excellence is a tough one. Talent is not enough, as I have alluded to. The different levels of support, support required to each athlete's progress. Many of the athletes we witnessed in Glasgow and in more recent games in the Gold Coast have received local support to start with, inevitably with their parents and family. Uh, and that will have gone on to local councils and ALIO support. And, and uh, if, if national support uh, uh, moves through Sports Scotland, with, uh, with them funding elite sport to, 11, uh, to a tune of 11.89 million, and if that hard work and dedication leads to them to even higher level, UK sport finances the elite end of the sport to a tune of 12.35 million, mainly receiving a wage, access to the best facilities around the world, as well as medical backup to the very highest standard. I should also mention that Scotland is pun punching way above its weight with 30% of athletes on UK world-class programmes coming from Scotland, compared to a population of 8.4% of the UK. That takes me on to the days, uh, uh, that, that, that's what it takes these days to reach peak performance. If we were to look at elite sport, we would note that not many train in these shores. They are prepared to, uh, to uh, are funded to leave their homes and families to train abroad, reaching for that extra percentage. That means the difference between podium and an also run. It is a tough game. Success at this level is a complicated game, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and requires years of planning on top of consistent and determined effort on the training grounds. The success of our sports, Scottish sportsmen and women will stand them in good stead as they strive for future goals and even more amazing performances. I move the amendment in my name.
And well officer. done to timekeeping, Mr Whittle. You're a star. I now call David Stewart to speak to move amendment 11967.1. Five minutes, Stewart. Take a leaf out of Mr Whittle's deep. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. And I want to thank the Minister for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber. Our Scottish athletes have excelled themselves in the Gold Coast, as we've heard, and it's right we take this time to recognise and celebrate their achievements. Um, Scotland have sent athletes to compete in the Commonwealth Games since they first began in 1930, and since then the event is, in, is involved. Uh, at the 1998 Games, team sports were added for the first time, and the 2002 Games in Manchester Medal events for athletes with disability were integrated into the programme. And the most recent Games in the Gold Coast, the 21st Commonwealth Games, were no different, with a focus on gender equality. And for the first time, as we've heard from the Minister, there was a gender parity in a number of medal events for men and women, and at certain events, over 50% of the technical officials were also uh, women. So the celebration of these achievements show that beyond mere competition and world-class sport, the Commonwealth Games have a bigger aim. The aim is to, to unite 71 diverse nations and territories from across the world. Their vision is a family of nations under the core values of humanity, equality and diversity, and is a vision to which Scotland has wholeheartedly committed. The welcome given to visitors at the 1970 Edinburgh Games, which I remember, gave the event its identity as the Friendly Games, and the partnership between the Games and UNICEF was then launched at the 2014 Glasgow Games. This partnership sought to harness the power of sport to transform children's lives and has reached more than 11.7 million children in 52 countries. Scotland has much to be proud of on the field. As the motion states, the Gold Coast Games marked Scotland's most successful overseas Commonwealth Games to date with 44 medal hall. It was clear in the interviews that Scottish athletes gave ahead of the Games they were there to do business, and they certainly delivered. There were, mem there were very me many memorable moments, as we've heard from our two speakers earlier. Neil Fatchy winning the second double gold in the blind and visually impaired sprint and time trials. Mark Austin securing a surprise bronze medal in the triathlon. And at our third Games at the age of only 21, Grace Reid scooping an amazing gold medal in the diving. One of the benefits of the Commonwealth Games is that they give Scottish athletes a place to shine, which restrictions in Olympic places and Team GP do not always allow. Much was rightly made of Duncan Scott in the pool, storming to victory in the 100m freestyle and winning a total of six medals. Yet the strength and ability of Scottish athletes was on display across a range of events, including but not limited to cycling, bowls, swimming and gymnastics. All the members of Team Scotland, the athletes, coaches and wider staff deserve congratulations for this incredible achievement. Each of the competitors has a story about how they were inspired into their sport. For many, it was watching the homegrown athletes that came before them compete on the world stage. Beyond the excitement of the Games, the hope is therefore that the achievements of Scottish athletes in the Gold Coast will inspire a whole new generation to get active and involved in sport. However, we know that, at least in this area, aspiration is not enough. Sometimes it's perspiration as well, presiding officer. Getting people excited about doing sport rather than simply sitting on the sofa watching sport requires more than encouraging talk. As the legacy for the Commonwealth Games report stated, legacy is not automatic or inevitable. Rather, hosting major events can be used as a catalyst. So in the aftermath of the 2014 Games, much was promised as a legacy and the Games were to have ongoing social and economic effects, both for Glasgow, where the event was held, but also across the country. And the legacy report from the 2014 Glasgow Games was published this April, and the verdict on the long-standing impact was mixed. Thankfully, the facilities and infrastructure put in place for the Games are, of course, still of benefit to communities in which they're situated. And since 2009, there's been an increase in attendances and membership at sports facilities across Glasgow with an average high levels of satisfaction with the available resources. And whilst the success of the Gold Coast may suggest that high level performances benefit, there's clear much to be done to ensure its benefit is felt equally across society. And an outcome reported in April's legs report was an increase in physical activity for those who are already active. 
I'm very conscious of time, presiding officer, and obviously I want to compete uh, very highly with my Tory opponent across there. Um, I will quickly go to the conclusion. So I believe that the uh, success of the Gold Coast Games for Scotland cannot be overstated. And underneath the impressive medical uh, was also stories of perseverance and personal triumph. And as the American sprinter Wilma Randolph said, the triumph can't be had without the struggle. Thank you. Please move your amendment. I moved it at the start, President. Did you really? Yes, yeah. Now, good for you. You've ticked me off. Uh, Tavis Scott, please. I call Tavis Scott. Four minutes, Mr. Scott, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'm not going to join in Dave Stewart's perspiration there, although it was a, a, it was a noble, uh, noble effort to link uh, sport and participation. Uh, and I, nor am I going to uh, repeat, as the Minister and, and uh, Brian Whittle rightly did, the list of those who uh, were so successful, other to very much share uh, their sentiments, uh, and indeed David Stewart's sentiments, about uh, the success of the uh, of the Gold Coast uh, and uh, all that uh, came from it. Personally, I enjoyed uh, the swimming, the hockey uh, and the cycling in no particular order, not least of which because um, Chris Hoy's uh, illustration from back from the studio, he was doing the punditry uh, back, on, uh, back on planet Earth, uh, for those of us who watched it, as Brian Buttle rightly said in the, in the early hours of the morning, uh, his description of the pain that you go through as, in a, as an elite athlete uh, in his particular discipline was something that will probably stay longer with me than anything else I've probably watched in those uh, in 10 days of, of competition. I uh, winced through most of his uh, television description uh, of that. I actually wanted to make just a couple of points in uh, very briefly on uh, legacy uh, because the um the investment that uh, a country makes in, its sp in elite sport, and the Minister rightly mentioned uh, the role that Sports Scotland and the governing bodies uh, make, uh, the investment they, we make in elite sport uh, needs to be balanced by the investment we make in participation, in, in encouraging a more healthy lifestyle, in making sure that uh, uh, people can live uh, lives which uh, are not such a drain on our health service, are not such a drain in other ways uh, on the uh, state. Uh, and it struck me to look back at uh, Glasgow from the context of the three athletes who um, were from Shetland and who, who were part of, the, of Team Scotland in Glasgow 2014. And I got in touch with all three of them the other day. Uh, Eric Davis is uh, a medical student. Uh, well, there can't be many better things uh, in that sense in terms of, uh, uh, of helping for the uh, future. Uh, Andrew Strachan, who swam in the final of the 100 breaststroke in Glasgow, uh, is a sports uh, development officer for the council at home in Shetland and, and also works for Sports Scotland as a community uh, hub sports officer, if that's the right description of all those titles uh, she has behind her name. And Andrea um, is not at the moment actively involved in swimming, coaching and all the rest of it. I, I just sense that after such an intensive period, particularly for um, for uh, in swimming where um, you start in a pool at a very young age and you get up and go so early on for so many years uh, that it probably takes a little bit to get back into it uh, but to have her involved in sports and active schools in, in, uh, in uh, my part of the world in Shetland uh, is very uh, welcome indeed and finally uh, Linda Flaws who was our table tennis player she was part of the Team Scotland um, table tennis team in, in uh, Glasgow. She's now a full-time physio at the Golden Jubilee uh, and has been since last month. Uh, but her point to me the other day was uh, she cannot wait to get back into uh, table tennis, both playing and, and uh, knowing Linda, she certainly uh, will do that, but also in coaching uh, as well and putting something back in, not less necessarily for elite athletes, but encouraging uh, people in that sense to play a game that we can all play. Uh, and, and that, for me, is, is uh, very much part of the legacy of, uh, of these games, that people like Brian Whittle have the chance to put all they have learnt into the future, into, the, into both elite athletes and into participation, and encourage others to recognise uh, how important sport and just active lives uh, can be uh, for uh, their future. I'm sure Marie Goujon. That's the trailer. That's the trailer. Yes. Thank you. I, I I'll give you a bit extra, coming, Mr. Scott. Uh, but it's, it would only be fair for me to recognise Marie Goujon's role, uh, personal role and personal commitment in that sense. Uh, let me let, let you into a secret, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, of when the 
European Committee were in Dublin back in the early part of the uh, year. Uh, who was the member of that committee who went out running first thing in the corner in the, in the morning? Yes, Marie Goujon was that uh, person. So we were all uh, deeply impressed by her commitment to uh, 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 to that triathlon that she's taking part uh, later uh, in the year. Uh, so two final points. Uh, the first is the minister mentioned uh, UK coaching. Uh, she will know, uh, sorry, UK sport, I apologise, UK sport. Uh, she will know that uh, many coaches from across the country are coming up to Edinburgh, I think in June, as part of an international, or sorry, a national, a Scottish, uh, sorry, a UK-wide coaching event. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, part of very much the legacy that I hope she would reflect on in her uh, winding remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate, strict four-minute speeches. Fulton McGregor, followed by Rachel Hamilton. Mr McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. And as well as reminding the Chamber and the PLO to the Health Secretary, I'd also uh, like to mention that I've also been out running with Marie Goujon and suffice to say that I won't be doing that again in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd like to start by congratulating Team Scotland on their success at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games and they really did us all proud and it was another great example of what talented athletes we have representing our country. We did well enough to pick up our medal every single day and saw our best performance at away games, picking up 44 medals in total. Every one of our athletes should be proud of this achievement. And it was great to see that of the 224 athletes to compete in all 18 sports, 93 of these were women, which is the biggest Scottish female contingent in away games. We also sent 18 para-athletes as para-disciplines fully integrated into the games. This means there's no separate event or ticket for a para-sport and a medal won by a para-athlete was contributed the same as, for example, for example, the men's wheelchair 1500 as the men's 1500 metres, and that's exactly how it should be, presiding officer. We have seen some really talented emerging athletes at, this game, at these games, and I believe this is partly down to the Glasgow 2014 legacy, where medalists such as Kimberley and Louise Rennix from Cote Bridge won gold medals in the judo. And I'm pleased to say that both of them are still involved in the game and coaching young people. We have sustained investment in our sporting system as sport is a way of life in Scotland, and this is borne out. Um, personally for me, but a huge interest in the cross-party group that I started in the future of football in Scotland, where we've been having open discussions and making all levels of the game accessible to all sectors of society. The Scottish Government investment put into our community sport has produced strong results and we continue to inspire performance generally. We have seen an expansion in our active schools programmes, as others have mentioned, that allow young people to participate in sport around the school day. In the last academic year, there were nearly 300,000 distinct participants in active schools activities. We also have 192 community sports hubs in operation throughout Scotland, which allows communities to provide welcoming environments for support activities. In my constituency, both Christon High School and St Andrews High are both community sport hubs, and both of which are home to many talented and ambitious young sportspersons. Cope Bridge High has a school of rugby, which has excelled in recent times, and Buchanan High School recently sent finalists to the Special Olympics World Winter Games in 2017. St Ambrose High, amongst, many, amongst having many other talented young people, have a student in the National Scotland wheelchair basketball team that is set to meet with them this weekend. So in my own constituency alone, there's a lot of good work in talented young people. We've also seen a transformation in our sporting facilities across the country since winning the bid in 2007 for the Glasgow 2014. It found that games had driven the development of high quality sports facilities, contributed 740 million to the Scots Scotland's economy, and regenerated large parts of Glasgow and enhanced Scotland's international reputation. However, media focused on the finding the Games had little impact on sport participation or activity rates. I was pleased um, that plans to get rid of the tracks at Ravenscraig were scrapped recently after public pressure put paid to that. This is why it's important that the Scottish Government has protected the Sports Scotland budget and is committed to increasing Sports Scotland's core funding by £2 million in 2018-19 from 29.7 million to 31.7 million. This means that we'll be able to prioritise the development of sport within Scotland. In 2017-2018, Sports Scotland invested over £10 million in the governing bodies of the Commonwealth Games to ensure they could develop all aspects of their sport, delivering both participation and performance outcomes. We also invested 163,000 directly in Commonwealth Games Scotland, and this continued investment should be celebrated as it will reap the benefits through sporting success in the future. But we all need to play a part in making sport accessible for everyone and thereby getting the many social, physical and mental health benefits that exercise brings people, I think outlined very well by Tavish Scott. For example, in... I'm afraid you won't have much time for okay. a for example. You're there, going to there, close. There are some good examples locally, and, but I will need to leave it at that, in presiding officer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Rachel Hamilton, followed by Alec Rowley.
I'd like to begin by congratulating everyone who took part in the Commonwealth Games, especially those um, from across Scotland, and particularly a big shout out to those who represented um, the borders. Deputy Presiding Officer, some may understand that sport only serves the elite physical specimens and that it can only be enjoyed by us mere mortals with a packet of crisps and a pint of beer or a glass of wine in front of the television. How wrong those people are. Sport is for all and can be enjoyed by all. It unites us all, be it country, region, constituency, town or village. We can all get behind those sporting heroes, professional and amateur, and dig deep for our teams. Sport is so much more than sport itself. As a netball coach, I experienced that firsthand. It was not only netball I taught, it was the values that came with it. Teamwork, discipline, responsibility, respect, to name but a few. Through netball and other sports, these can be taught to young girls and boys. Those who read the local papers in the Scottish Borders will see that I recently participated in women's uh, rugby training in Kelso. Women spoke of the barriers they'd overcome to play rugby, but the very fact that they come together as a team now speaks volumes of how far they have, have actually got. I was pleased to see that women's rugby made its Commonwealth debut this year, and women are defying gender stereotypes in sport. They're proving that women can play rugby, that rugby isn't just for men. That in itself is a legacy, a legacy created by women of determination. I want to see financial commitment to match that ambition. It's a while back now, but in 2013 and 14, help was given to upgrade the team changing facilities at Kelso Rugby Club from the Sports Facility Fund. This type of investment makes sport accessible, and the more accessible we make it, the better the outcome. Since the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, the Borders has received investment in sports facilities, including 35,000 in community hubs. The Legacy Active Places Fund saw 357,000 invested across seven facilities projects in the borders through the Legacy 2014 Active Places Fund. And with partner contributions, the total invested in these projects was just short of 900,000. But overall, the Sports Scotland investment in the Scottish border borders has remained static. We need to look and explore whether certain sports are being neglected or whether funding is attributed to one sport considerably more than another. Ensuring all sports are accessible and no sport is left behind will increase physical activity in my own constituency and, of course, across Scotland. And frankly, we do need to look at ways to encourage active health. Scotland does have an obesity issue. Um, it has one of the worst obesity records amongst OECD countries. And over a third of adults do not meet guidelines for moderate of vi vigorous physical activity. Also, two thirds of adults in Scotland are overweight, including 29% who are obese. And that includes children as well, who are at risk of um, being overweight, including obesity. These are deeply concerning statistics, and let us not forget that obesity leads to diabetes, heart disease and other illnesses. It adds pressure on our NHS. An active, healthy lifestyle, not one as strenuous as professional athletes, but just 20 minutes of activity a day, a lunchtime walk, for example, is a preventative measure to help obesity. Do I have four minutes, Deputy Presiding Officer? Yeah, OK. <laughs> that was your subtle one-minute warning that appears okay. to be very unsubtle. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's the preventative me measures that will help reduce obesity and encourage a lifestyle that make one's own quality of life better and also reduce uh, the pressure on the NHS. A win-win for all. And that is a legacy. And that's what I'd like to see us working more towards. Um, to, to finish, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would like to reiterate my congratulations to Scotland's Commonwealth athletes and those 14 incredibly inspiring young people from the Scottish borders. Sport teaches core values and that in itself is a lesson we should not forget. Thank you very much. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Emma Harper. Mr Rowley, please. Signing officer, I would also want to offer my congratulations to all the athletes uh, and coaches and everyone involved with Team Scotland for the excellent Commonwealth Games. It is right that in this Parliament we acknowledge the great achievements of the Scottish athletes at these Games, as well as paying tribute to all people who competed in what was a great advert for sport across the Commonwealth. The two weeks of compulsive TV for us spectator sports people was great, but for those competing it was weeks, months and years of hard work that got them to their best in their chosen sport. The briefing from Sports Scotland for this debate shows that there is real progress being made across the country in supporting people to be involved in sport. And I hope all the athletes that did compete will be able to spend some time getting out into our schools and local sports clubs to speak about their experiences. Whilst I applauded the progress being made 
to widen access to sport. There is no room for complacency and there is still too many young people that do not have access to facilities and coaching. I was able to watch a fair bit of the games and cheer when we were winning the medals, but to be honest, cheering on all the athletes and just enjoying the sport. I think my most nervous experience was watching the marathon where I caught Callum Hawkins and I thought he had done enough to take the gold, but was then overcome by the heat. But I saw an interview with Callum later that week and he was clear in his determination and that he was more determined than ever to achieve his goal of gold. And that is the true spirit of the Commonwealth Games, just as it is the true spirit of sport that takes place in communities all over Scotland every weekend. In that marathon, we were, of course, able to celebrate Robbie Simpson taking the bronze and well done to him. Now, I know some people say that sport and politics should be kept apart. But a big moment for me was when Tom Daly of England won gold in the diving and used that platform to highlight LGBTI rights and the lack of them in many Commonwealth countries. As an athlete, I think he was brave to do this and I want to quote him. He said, there are 37 countries in the Commonwealth where it is illegal to be who I am and hopefully we can reduce that number. I feel with the Commonwealth we can really help push some of the other nations to relax their laws on anti-gay stuff. Well done, Tom Daly. And well done to the Commonwealth Games for creating an inclusive sporting atmosphere that many of the member countries could and should learn from. This was the first major sporting event that achieved gender equality by having an equal amount of events for male and female athletes and the largest ever fully integrated paradiscipline sports programme. So well done to Scotland's 224 athletes and to everyone who competed in the Games. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. Call Emma Harper to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Ms Harper, please. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this afternoon's debate and will support this motion. As others have mentioned, this is good news that we speak of Team Scotland's success today. And many people enjoy watching the sports, such as ath athletics, swimming, badminton, weightlifting and cycling, that are sports that are all well known to us all. And there are other less kent sports, such as competitive shooting, which is where I will focus my comments today. David, David McMath won a gold medal for double trap shooting David is 21 years old and David is for Castle Douglas in the southwest of Scotland. David won Scotland's 30th medal out of the total 44 of the Games and his win tipped Scotland over the 29 medal mark to give Scotland our best ever performance for an overseas Games. Trap shooting is a game of movement, action and split second timing. It requires the accuracy and skill to repeatedly aim, fire and break the four and a quarter inch discs which are hurled through the air at a speed of 42 miles per hour. The palm sized orange targets look large enough when placed in your hand but they look like an aspirin tablet when they're flying through the air. I called David to give him best wishes and congratulate him. I found him humble polite and very much down to earth. And on an incidental note, I was speaking to my dad about David winning the gold medal and dad said he knew David McMath Sr. They compete against each other in carpet bowls, which is another less known Scottish sport. And my dad said I was related to the medalist. According to my father, my grandpa's brother's first wife's daughter's 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 son is the Commonwealth champion. And according to my dad, that makes us kin. Dad and I had a really interesting conversation about it and that's what led me to phone David. We talked about the future of shooting as a sport and in both the Olympic and Commonwealth Games, David told me that he was going to have to start learning skeet instead of double trap. This is because double trap has been cut from the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. The future of double trap at the Olympics has been in danger for some time now and many shooters have been changing disciplines with many switching to Olympic trap which is different from double or skeet. The recommendation to remove double trap was made to help achieve gender equality in shooting as part of 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Additionally, the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham 
have taken the decision to drop all shooting events from the Games. This is unfortunate. Shooting is a great sport for small nations and all the small countries, so most small nation islands can be included in the sport of shooting, and anyone can do it. Competitive shooting is a sport open to a wide variety of people. Many competitive shooters are older. In fact, shooter Robert Pitcairn from Canada, who competed this year, is 79 years old and is officially the oldest athlete in the history of the Commonwealth Games. There are also a wide range of competitive shooting events in the Paralympics, and shooting is inclusive of folks with disabilities. Presiding officer, I'll conclude by saying the motion states, believes that sustained investment and commitment in the whole sporting system is vital to enable people of all ages, backgrounds and abilities to regularly take part in sport and exercise. So, presiding officer, I would ask that the minister explore whether there is an opportunity to preserve competitive shooting, perhaps at the UK Sports Cabinet meeting, in future games so that people of all ages, gender and ability can continue to participate in this inclusive sport. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by George Adam. Mr Adam will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stewart, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be able to take part in this debate this afternoon. Uh, these games have been hailed as Scotland's finest games, and I pay tribute to all those who have uh, assisted, coached, supported, attended, and took part in these games. We can enjoy their success. Today, we celebrate the success. These individuals gave of their time and their talents, uh, and it's right that we honour them for doing that. Scotland has a proud history and has hosted the Commonwealth Games in a number of occasions over the past decades. Uh, obviously, Glasgow in 2014, but Edinburgh also in 1970 and 1986. It's my pleasure to speak today, and it's compounded not least due to the fact that within my own region, uh, have provided with some really great world-class athletes uh, for these Games in recent years, and no more so than the most recent ones we've enjoyed. Indeed, those from Clackmannanshire and the adjacent city of Stirling uh, both have figured very highly uh, this year. And that's been due to the, the university and the facilities that we have at Stirling University. Alois Duncan Scott, an extraordinary swimmer in his own right, has won one gold, one silver and four bronze medals to become Scotland's most successful athlete in a single Commonwealth Games. And we should celebrate that success. The Friendly Games, as it's been called, and he had the honour of, of being the, 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 the Saltar flag bearer at the closing ceremony. He is one of Stirling University's most rising stars, and he claimed his first ever individual uh, for the 200 metre freestyle. As I said, Deputy Presiding Officer, this young man uh, fought long and hard and has achieved so much during his time. Uh, Stirling is very, very proud of his achievements uh, and uh, the members of the team who are participating and working and the coaches and the families and the support mechanism that takes place. And that takes place not just in my region, but across other regions. And others have supported and talked about today these individuals who give up their time to be part. And coaching, uh, as my, my fellow member uh, has indicated uh, this afternoon, uh, is vitally important. Rachel knows and has said what importance that brings but it's the time commitment that these individuals give to give these individuals the chance to uh, develop and, and see their potential grow. And that is most rewarding, most rewarding. So, as I say, Deputy Presiding Officer, I have certainly enjoyed uh, being a member of the audience. I'm not a sports person, I never have been, but I can, I can still participate in watching uh, what, what takes place. Uh, I, I, and I'm surrounded by individuals today in this chamber who do participate on a regular basis, and I can celebrate their success too. So as I've said, you know, I, I live uh, in Bridge of Allen, and it's adjacent to, uh, very close to, uh, the Stirling University campus. That campus has phenomenal facilities uh, to ensure that the students and the athletes that use these can benefit. And I pay tribute to uh, Sports Scotland uh, for all the work they're doing to ensure that that takes place. The Gold Coast can be rightly proud of all their achievements, which allowed Australia to have a platform for hosting these games. 
the relevance of these games continue to provide a vital part of the sporting calendar and provides a backdrop for the host as well as opportunities for the participants. I congratulate the Gold Coast on all they've achieved, but congratulate Scotland on its tremendous achievements and look forward to the next Games in 2022 hosted by England in the city of Birmingham. On that occasion, we look forward to continuing our success and introducing uh, to the Commonwealth an array of new stars who are at present coming through the ranks. And that's so important that individuals have the opportunity to progress. Uh, and that's what the Commonwealth Games does. It's called the Friendly Games. And I think that, in its testament, is outstanding. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. There's nothing wrong with being a non-participant, Mr Stewart. Don't be intimidated by the athletes in here. Mr Adams, please. Me both as non-participant sports fans then, presiding officer. Uh, I'm only too pleased to take part in this debate for a number of reasons and to congratulate Team Scotland on their great success at the Commonwealth Games. Many will be aware that uh, sport is an important part of my life and unfortunately I'm no longer participating due to a long-term injury or shall that be just be that I'm getting older. And I'll share a story where I actually got to a stage where in the Paisley 10K, one of my supporters, luckily enough, because I'll clean it up slightly, presiding officer, she told me at the time as I uh, jogged through Fergusley Park how much she appreciated my work as an MSP, but in no uncertain terms, I definitely wasn't a runner. So uh, at that point, I thought it was time to hang up the running shoes and move on. But during my lifetime, I've always been aware of how important success like this is uh, in our local community. Because when I was young, it was Alan Wells who had his spr uh, sprinting exploits. And that's the first ones I remember at multi-sports games. Just a bit later, in uh, 1986, uh, European Championship, I was watching a certain Brian Whittle on the track run round with one shoe and get a gold medal. In the 4 by 400 metres relay, to this day, he still blames Chris Akabusi for standing on his shoe. But uh, one shoe whittle, whatever happened to him? You know, but the performance of all our athletes uh, is, will inspire and can inspire young people and encourage them to take up sport, but not necessarily for them to become elite athletes, but to ensure they have a health, lead healthy, balanced lifestyle. Sport also teaches us how to make goals and how you can work hard to achieve them. Life lessons that all of us probably could use and will use as we move forward. Uh, when we're talking about the games, there are a number of uh, Paisley clubs that were involved and had uh, players there. Kelburn Hockey Club actually gave quite a lot of the men's team uh, based in Paisley for uh, field hockey. And basketball pay uh, Paisley had a player there as well. And it shows you that it's all these other sports are not necessarily the most exciting ones, the ones that everyone goes to see, that actually that something like the Commonwealth Games can show what we can do. And it's what the inspiration part of it, presiding officer, is that in constituencies like mine in Paisley, I, I talk about all the time about some unsupported programmes that bring sports to all young people. And that's why I've worked with St Myrne FC and Remshire Council to look at ways for St Myrne, who are based in Fergusley Park, to deliver a sports programme in our communities that can focus young people on what they can achieve using sport and all sports to get young people engaged in their community and in their schools but because as we all know education doesn't just stop at the school gates and for many young people sport is a fantastic way to express themselves and move forward but presiding officer it is sporting excellence like that shown by team scotland that inspires us all but let's look at the medal hall that we had this year, 44 medals. And that doesn't include a sport that we were very successful with the last time. Judo wasn't there this year. And back in this, that fantastic summer of 2014, Team Scotland won 13 medals in judo alone. So, presiding officer, Team Scotland's success is in the Gold Coast has encouraged this middle-aged man to re-engage with his local gym. It might, be, it might not show, but it's a work in progress. But is that not the point? presiding officer. Elite sports stars inspire us, all of us, encourage us to do better. So can I just finish by saying well done to Team Scotland and everyone and let's hope this is something we can build on for the future. Thank you very much Mr Adam. Uh, closing speech is called Lana Sarward, close for Labour. Four minutes please Mr Sarward. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer and can I start by thanking the Minister for bringing forward this debate today and join her in congratulating all our fantastic athletes and all the team behind our athletes. Can I put on the record right at the start as a uh, Glasgow boy born and bred that despite how great the Commonwealth Games were, the greatest ever Commonwealth Games were clearly uh, in Glasgow in 2014. Uh, but can't, uh, absolutely still the case. Um, so we want to congratulate all the team who did our country proud, every single one of them flying the flag for themselves, 
their teammates, their family and their country. And across the board success from the pool to the velodrome, from the boxing ring to the bowling green, 44 medals, every one of them an inspiration to people who might only for the first time be trying out a sport they saw on the TV these past few weeks. And can I say how inspirational it is to have a genuine athlete amongst us uh, in this chamber? I mean Marie Goujon, of course, rather than, <laughs> rather than uh, one, one shoe Whittle who struggled to get it to his seat last week for decision time. Um, can I also thank uh, Dave Stewart and Alec Rowley in, in particular for, for mentioning the, the unity of the 71 nations and the point about that around the Commonwealth Games, but also the wider point about standing up for our shared values, our shared values of equality uh, and fairness against all forms of prejudice, uh, be that gender prejudice, homophobia or any other form of prejudice, and how the Commonwealth Games can be a great reminder of what we have achieved together, but all we all still have to do um, in order to fight prejudice in all its forms. Uh, Dave Stewart mentioned that he remembered the Commonwealth Games from the 1970s. Uh, I apologise to my colleague, I don't remember the 1970s Commonwealth <laughs> Games and I don't believe the Minister remembers them um, either, but I'm sure they were a triumph nonetheless. Um, our amendment today is uh, clear on the need to use the success of Scotland's athletes in whichever sport to drive not just more medalists, but actually more physical activity in all of us to inspire participation at whatever level of ability. Um, and to the team behind the team, the coaches, the physios, the sports scientists, and the support crew, um, I am pleased we are able to come together today to congratulate all of them on their shared success. Uh, but long before the medals were hung around their neck, the athletes took their first steps in a journey that ended with that final step onto the podium. They were beginners in whatever their sport was, and they have been supported along the way by volunteer coaches, by governing bodies, by sports scientists and all the crew, which is why the pathway they travel is so important and why the investment on that pathway is so important too. So we can have sporting success in elite sport, but also encourage active participation. Um, and I do say gently to, to the Minister, we have work to do in terms of this chamber to collectively make sure we are adequate funding our local authorities, but also our national sport agencies to encourage that active participation and hopefully more medalists uh, along the way. Because the reality is for every athlete who stood on that podium in Australia, there are participants here at home who are seeing the impact um, of budget cuts and the impact that has on their participation. So we will be supporting the government's motion today, but we hope we can work alongside the government to participate in, in using the success of the Games to inspire a generation and to actually put further investment back into active participation so we can build that uh, physical activity to have us being the healthy, a nation we want us uh, to be. Because that is the real prize, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the real prize to lower levels of obesity, to reduce levels of di diabetes, of heart disease, of cancer. And so let's use that inspiration of the Commonwealth Games. Let's use the inspiration of those athletes to say once and for all, let's build that healthy, bright nation for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarr. I call on Brian Whittle to close for the Conservative. Five minutes, please, Mr. Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. So can I say to all my fellow athletes and uh, Anna Sawar, uh, <laughs> today's debate, as, would be, as we would expect, has been a consensual, uh, conventional one with members highlighting their own favourite performances or recognising the overall result from Scottish teams were remarkable across all sports. And I, would, I wanted to say to George Adam, just to confirm that it was Akabusi that took my shoe off. Uh, I know you are torn because you watched that uh, read back in 1986 and have already admitted that it was one of the highlights of your life. Uh, and also the fact that I've coached your beloved St Mirren as well. You're a torn man. Um, can I, um, I just want to speak to Alex Rowley as well. He, he, he mentioned Tom Daly uh, and, and how Tom Daly used his success to highlight uh, inequalities throughout uh, the Commonwealth. And I think when you said he was brave, I think he was incredibly brave because he used that. And he took a, a, if you look at his timeline and his Twitter, he took a, an incredible amount of abuse to highlight what, what is uh, a continuing uh, inequality. In closing for the Scottish Conservatives, I, I wanted to pose the question, uh, what now? And there's always this debate around the legacy of, of major games of whether performance, sport influences participation. And there's no question for me that sport is performance-led. It, it's hard to argue against the type of ten tennis players seen playing during the Wimbledon fortnight, for example. The issue for me is around the initial access to opportunity and the sport's ability to accommodate that influx of numbers. I've always said it's a government that has this responsibility to ensure that opportunity is available to all irrespective of background or personal circumstance. Furthermore, and crucially, 
I think it's also a uh, government's responsibility to ensure that all understand that opportunity and have the confidence to access. That second part is more difficult one to define. None of, nonetheless, uh, the inequalities that currently exist cannot be tackled if we don't address this. And I think cost will be a, a significant factor here. And we often debate the money in people's pocket, but I would also suggest that is only half of the story. How much things cost is, is equally important. And I would argue it's easier and quicker to deal with this end of the wage, all the while continuing to tackle the money in people's pocket. I know Dave Stewart spoke particularly passionately to that. And I'm a great advocate of extracurricular activity before, during and after school. That old expression, fish where the fish are. Uh, I've never understood the situation where school children leave a school with perfectly good facilities, go home, then have to go somewhere else to take part. So let's make it easy to participate. Uh, should we be looking at aligning our physical education with the sports that will be or have been in recent games? What about connecting this up to local clubs in the area? Make that pro progress an easy one to do. I think councils and, uh, and alleyways lead local facilities and too many of the community facilities are closing down. Uh, so the Mellington, the Panthers, the Cumnocks, and many other are under threat in my area, citing that lack of numbers, therefore the affordability of that facility. And when in the planning stage, I would ask what consideration is given to the marketing and use of that facility? Are the local communities, the third sector organisations involved in that process? Is that an ongoing process by the Alloys and councils? And I have challenged the Alloys at their recent conference on this very issue. We cannot keep closing down local facilities and expect locals to access the central major, major venues, of which many are world class, and, and I welcome them. Uh, once again, I think it speaks to accessibility and affordability. And if we do, we're just removing a step in the process and taking participation away from many. I think Scottish school sport, if you, if you follow that, is becoming the bastion of, of private education. And actually, sport and activity in general is in danger of becoming a bastion of the so-called middle classes and out of reach of many. If we're really to seek a rounded legacy, we need to make conscious decisions and a concerted effort to change the current system. The amazing results and performances of our sportsmen and women at the Commonwealth Games in Australia highlight the progress as a nation we have made on the international stage. I think we can safely say that legacy at the performance end of sport is moving forward. We have got, a, we have got much right. There is still an issue to deal with, I think, but we are moving in a positive direction. However, I don't think we've, we've got, a, I think we've got a lot of work to do if we're going to have a similar impact at grassroots and at the participation level. And I think, I think without question, we haven't got that bit right and, and we're not cas cascading that through down into the councils. And I think it's an easy target. Sports facilities are an easy target when services have to be rationalised. Of course, a false economy, as, as, uh, uh, as Rachel Hamilton has said, because of the long-term impact on health, attainment, economy, justice, and so on. It's not but one or the other. It's not about elite or grassroots, because the reality is one drives and feeds the other. The Commonwealth Games will go from strength to strength, I'm sure, and the blue and white of Scotland will continue to be prominent, and our athletes will continue to write their own stories in their arenas. For 2022, it's likely that all competitors are already engaged in sport clubs and looking at Commonwealth Games athletes for ins inspiration, following their path, already recognising what's possible by the efforts of their heroes. What we need to do is ensure that those not yet engaged get that opportunity. For me, we must redouble our efforts there because that is what real legacy should look like. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr Whittle. I call on Eileen Campbell to close for the government. Six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, presiding officer, and I'm sincerely grateful for all the positive contributions that rightly celebrate the achievements of Team Scotland. The medalists, the powerful images, uh, the stories of courage and endurance. And I think uh, I would agree with uh, David Stewart's assessment that the team were clearly from the get-go there to do business. The strong performance by our athletes that, as Brian Whittle highlighted, is uh, proportionately higher than, our, than Scotland's population share gives us, I think, great encouragement to look to the European Championships in a few months' time and be hopeful of further successes uh, to celebrate and to cheer on uh, this August. And our performance a few weeks ago is all the more remarkable when we consider Glasgow's 53 medals, including, as George Adams uh, highlighted, 30 medals won in judo, which, of course, was not included in, in the 2018 Games. We won across nine sports and each day of the competition. Our athletes deserve the plaudits uh, and uh, right across, heard and rightly across uh, the chamber. And while there is rightly praise uh, in members' comments. There were also a range of issues raised on the broader uh, issues of sport, of activity, of accessibility, and of course, of uh, equality. 
uh, Brian Whittle uh, uh, made, uh, 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 both in his closing remarks and his opening remarks, uh, incredibly important uh, contributions. And I don't think any of us would uh, dare to rival his uh, experience. And of course, in 1986, I was just a, a wee girl uh, cheering him on, <laughs> uh, alongside Anna Sarwar, who was an even weird wee boy. So, um, as <laughs> um, but in... <laughs> Um, uh, sorry, I've lost my friends. And his, he also went over the important historical, he gives an important historical overview of the Commonwealth Games when reasserting the continued relevance of, of these games. And members may or may not, but I think they would be interested in the rich sporting archive, which is currently held uh, at Stirling University. Perhaps again, something that Alexander Stewart would be also uh, interested in, given he uh, explicitly raised the, the facilities at uh, Stirling University. And the artifacts, some of the artifacts that they have were on display in the Gold Coast, including uh, James Heatley's granddad, Sir Peter Heatley's Commonwealth Games jersey, when, uh, which I think is also really important. We recognise the importance of sporting memories and that memorabilia for the work that's going on around dementia and the support that's the, the support that sport can provide to help people cope with uh, that condition. And I think as well, maybe just as an aside, uh, back in the 1938 Games, I think it took six weeks for the team to travel out to Australia compared to the 24-hour uh, flight that we uh, have today. So again, great uh, strides forward and important though to, I think, reassert the relevance of these uh, Games. Similarly, Dave Stewart's contribution was incredibly informed and considered, reminding us that these friendly Games unite those 71 diverse territories from right across the Commonwealth, unite in its effort to enshrine humanity and diversity. And on that point, it is important to reflect on Alec Rowley's contribution, uh, rightly pointing out the requirement to never cease with the efforts to celebrate the diversity of the 71 nations, but to also never forget to press where progressive change is necessary. And I would absolutely echo the comments from Anna Sarwar on that point, that we need to promote uh, tolerance and always uh, fight uh, prejudice. And I think members may be uh, interested that this Commonwealth Games, which was a game of firsts, was also the first to have a reconciliation plan uh, to, yes, celebrate the cultural uh, diversity of the First Nations people, but to also reconcile the treatment of the Australia's Indigenous people uh, as well. And I think important for their own uh, very bespoke and tailored uh, legacy that that's something that they continue to work uh, towards uh, 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 completing. Many members uh, mentioned and raised uh, participation uh, and Sports Scotland system which does endeavour to do uh, work across a broad range of outcomes to ensure that grassroots participation is supported but also to ensure that performance is equally uh, supported. And I think it's important to recognise that um, while there are always uh, doubts and concerns around sport being uh, the bastion of the middle classes, it's important to recognise that 95% of funding is through is to grassroots sports. And I think it's important to recognise that a major legacy from the 2014 Games was the 192 now uh, community sports hubs across the length and breadth of the country, which uh, concentrating now on areas of deprivation, which enables the links to clubs to ensure there's appropriate uh, pathways to enable young people, uh, particularly or all people from the community, to enable them to take part in sport with an accessibility uh, there in their local community. I think also it's important to reflect on Sports Scotland's report that they uh, published and sent around in their briefing around the active schools coordinator's role, because that is in itself ensuring that children across all socioeconomic indicators have access uh, to sport and is really trying to do uh, in a very uh, strategic way, debunk the myths around who and who should uh, be involved uh, in sport. And I think we've much to celebrate in terms of our accessibility to sport, but it's certainly and much to build on, but absolutely much more uh, to do. And I finally will point on the issues that Rachel Hamilton uh, touched upon around women uh, in sport as well. These were uh, good, uh, these games were uh, good in terms of the diversity and, and helping women, uh, uh, there being the same medal chances for men and women. And I think as well in Scotland, we need to take notice of the fact that we need to do more to support women uh, and girls in sport. And that's why I've established the Women Girls Advisory Board to guide us on what more we need to do. Applaud her efforts uh, in netball. And of course, she would have been cheering on Joe Pettit from the Borders, who was part of the team along with her flatmate from Bigger, Emily Nicholl, uh, and of course, of course we'll take leadership from Mary Gujan, who's running uh, uh, all the time to inspire others to, <laughs> it seems, 
But I just wanted to point out, because my presiding officer, although it was an off-the-cuff remark that you made around that it doesn't matter if you don't take in part in sport, it absolutely is important that regardless of your ability that people do take part in sport. And that's why we should point and look at the uh, success of walking, which has delivered the uh, population level shift increase in participation in activity that Scotland has so needed. That's important that we recognise that of all ages, all stages, taking part in sport and activity, yes, it should be inspired by, by uh, inspirational heroes that we saw in the Commonwealth Games just a few weeks ago, but absolutely needs to be accessible. And of course, all those indicators will continue to push the changes that we need to make and the changes that we need to see to enable our country to become uh, more active more often. Uh, thank you. Duly reprimanded, uh, Minister. <laughs> Although in defence, I'm talking about activity, not sport. Some of us don't like sport, but we quite like to be active. Um, that's the last I'll say, and I'll not be jovial again. Um, we're now going to briefly take a pause while I let the front benches take their places for the next debate.